yeah, so, uh, so Christian already gave a little bit of an introduction about me. Uh, I've been developing sites for over 15 years. Um, it's much longer than that. Uh, I started when I was 11, but that doesn't really count, of course. Uh, but I've been doing it professionally for over, over 15 years. Uh, I stopped doing that because I, I have been building websites for 15 years and it was time for me for something different. Uh, so now I'm building Polypane. Uh, and what's interesting is if, if you've been doing it for a long time, is that like a lot has changed in that time. When I started, like there was no iPhone, there was no iPads, there was no responsive design. Uh, we used to use things called frame sets and objects for buttons. Um, those days are over, luckily. Uh, but I'm here to talk about the idea of responsive design. So responsive design, I'm sure all of you are familiar with it, but I'm going to go over it anyway, just to get everyone on the same page. So responsive design lets us adapt websites to various screen sizes. Uh, it was coined by Ethan Marcotte in an article that was uh, posted 11 years ago on the list of part. And uh, if I had to give like a definition of what responsive design is, then to me, responsive design is the way a website adapts to different screen sizes. And it does that by reflowing and repositioning content as the available space allows. So we do this obviously with media queries, but also with flexibly sized elements, like using percentages or minimum and maximum sizes. Uh, but more recently, uh, we can now also use things like Flexbox and Grid and CSS functions like Clamp and MinMax to do that in even easier ways. Uh, but as Christian alluded to, there was a time where the future looked quite different. Um, and that future was two webs, essentially. So in 2008, uh, I wrote an article on Narvore, uh, and there are some people in this call today who I think also wrote articles for Narvore, or at least were around when uh, Narvore was a, a relevant publication. Um, so I wrote an article on handheld style sheets then. So before media queries, the way you could use uh, at media was with different types. Nowadays, we really only have screen print and all for both screen and print, but we used to have like dozens of them, like handheld, held, bry, TV. N you could name it and there was like a, a specific type of style sheet for it. Now, of course, the style sheets had very, very bad support. Uh, like they were half implemented on Symbian, they were half implemented, but a different half on uh, Windows Internet Explorer for handheld devices. Uh, Opera Mini supported some of it, uh, but it just wasn't really a thing that you could efficiently use for anything but like the slightest tweaks. But the interesting thing is, uh, like when I wrote this, media features were like just around the corner. Uh, the CSS3 spec had been out for a little bit, uh, and there were like some browsers that were already supporting a few of, of the new media queries or the media features, uh, which was Opera 9 and Safari 3, uh, which goes to show like how long ago this was. Um, but like, if you look at it now, then, you know, media queries are supported everywhere and they have been supported for forever. And we just take that for granted. Uh, so as we do on the web, uh, now that something works very well everywhere, we're going to move on to things that don't work well everywhere yet, uh, and start focusing on that. So that's what we'll do in this talk. Uh, going over responsive design, like the way you do that in code, um, you want to do it mobile first. Uh, you want to use media queries with, with it in M's rather than pixels so that it sizes nicely as users zoom in and out of your, uh, in and out of their browser. 
you want to use a base font size of 16 pixels, not 10, not 12, not 14, 16, uh, which is what browsers have always been doing. It just took like us as the web development community a while to catch up. We always want to allow user sizing or user resizing. Uh, and of course, you know, on, uh, uh, on the web, there is no fault because there is literally no one viewport that your site is going to be viewed at. Uh, I actually, I, I built some tooling to check Google Analytics for like the different types of viewports. And you're very lucky if like the most common viewport has 5% of your users. So there is an incredibly long tail of different viewport sizes. So you can either worry about all of them or just accept that, you know, there is no one viewport and you just need to make sure that it doesn't really matter where, where the viewport ends. So from responsive design, we're now really going to responsive websites and what responsive websites are is that they're obviously still responsively designed but they go one step further in that they also actively adapt to user preferences with user preference media queries. Uh, so they don't just reason about what a device can do, which is what traditionally media queries were all about. Like we used to have device width, device height, like the number of colors that a device could show uh, that was once a relevant media query. But now we're really moving on to being responsive to the user, their needs, their environment, their preferences, and the device is really just a, a proxy for that. So if we now look at what our websites can respond to, I think there's four cat categories. So there's user preferences, there's their environment, there's their network conditions, and of course, there's still their device. So today we'll go over what is possible in each of these categories. And as I mentioned earlier, not everything will be equally well supported, uh, but for each feature I'll share in, in which browser it already works. Look at user preferences. Uh, there's quite a few and half of these don't have great support yet, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll go over them anyway. So we'll, we'll start with a uh, preferred color scheme or as, as most people know, it's uh, dark mode right uh nobody really cared about dark modes and then apple came out with dark modes and it turns out that we already had a media query for that as well um so preferred color scheme uh it indicates whether your user prefers to see a light or a dark version of your site so they might prefer a dark version because it's easier on their eyes because it usually has less contrast there's less light shining in their face literally but Conversely, they might also prefer a light version because it usually has increased contrast, like things are easier to read. So neither is better and both are beneficial to different uh, visitors. So you can use the preferred color scheme media feature to check and the values for that are both are dark or light. There used to also be a preference or a, a value called no preference, but it got removed because it was essentially the same as light mode and browsers just implemented it from the get go as it's, it does the same thing as light. Uh, so after two or three years of having no preference mapped to light in all the browsers, they just decided to nix it from the uh, specification as well. So now it's, it's just dark or light. Uh, and that's that's like nice and easy, nice and clear. So most of you will have a website in light mode because it's apparently the default. And adding a dark mode from scratch can be a very big project. So to do it right, essentially. So if you want to add dark mode, but you don't have a lot of time, something I uh, I often use is something I call cheap dark mode. And it works like this. It's a, it's a tiny bit of CSS. So what we do is we first invert the entire page using the invert filter. And what this does is it makes everything that's dark light and the other way around. Uh, unfortunately, what this also does is it inverts the, the hue. 
So anything that's blue becomes orange, for example. And of course, that's not great because if your brand colors are blue, then you can't suddenly have your site be, be orange. Uh, so after we invert the colors, we then rotate the U by 180 degrees, essentially rotating it back to the original colors. And that means we, we end up with the original U. Now this won't match the colors perfectly because the lightness is different, but it's usually close enough. Now at this point, all your images and videos will look pretty bad because they've been inverted and U shifted. So we need to fix that. And there's a really easy fix for that. We just do the same thing again. And because both the invert and the U rotates are uh, like 180 degrees or the, the inverse, executing them again or calling them again basically brings the images and videos back to their, their original colors. Um, the only trick here is that at this point, the background color hasn't changed along. So all the content on top of your background color is now inverted, but the background color itself hasn't yet. So what we need to do here is add an explicit background color. And an easy one you might think of is, well, I'll just add black, but usually black has too much contrast and it will become, uh, difficult or hard to read for people. So what you want to do for to make it look slightly nicer is to have a slightly off black color. I've used like a, a regular gray here, but you can also add a little bit of color depending on what you want for your site. So like a little bit of blue, a little bit of green, a little bit of red. Um, and that can really bring like this very cheap dark mode to something that that looks pretty good, pretty acceptable. Uh, so as I said, it's not perfect. It's not as good as a fully custom dark theme where you would make very different choices, uh, but it will get you something decent in not a lot of lines of code. So here's what that would look like. Uh, on the right is just the regular site, and then on the right uh, or on the left is the regular site, and then on the right is the cheap dark mode one. So that's not bad. Now, on to prefers reduced motion. So with this, users can indicate that they want to see less stuff happening on screen. The reason they want to do this can be things like motion sickness, uh, vestibular disorders that can cause nausea and dizziness. Uh, the animations can also be distracting to them due to something like ADD, or just that they don't want to wait for any of the animations. So if a user has this turned on, it doesn't mean you can't show any motion. Uh, it says prefers reduced motion, not prefers no motion, but you do have to be mindful about it. So you want to use motion only where it, it helps understanding uh, and prefer animations that fade rather than move because they're much easier to process and much easier on the eye. And of course for videos uh, like Apple does here, don't auto play them when this media query matches. So for this media query, there's two values. There's either reduce or no preference. And the way you want to use this or the best way to approach this is to consider motion as an enhancement. So you design your site without motion or just with the essential motion on your, uh, that you need for understanding. And then you only add in animations when the user has no preference. If that, however, is not an option or the site is already built, you can also use the prefers reduce motion reduce option to turn animations off. And for this, again, I have uh, a cheap reduce motion solution. Um, and fair warning, but this is very crude because it will turn all animations and transitions off, even the ones that would have been okay because they're subtle fades, for example. Um, if you look at this, you see some weird values like one millisecond and minus one millisecond. Um, and that's to make sure that the animations still play. They just don't play visibly. And we do this because this way, all the events that are associated with animations and transitions in JavaScript will still be called. Uh, whereas if we set 
them to zero milliseconds, uh, they don't get called. So any JavaScript animation or APIs that depend on the animation end and the transition end events uh, would then not work anymore. So if you do this, however, you do need to go over your entire site to make sure that everything's still visible. Uh, for example, with transitions that go from transparent to opaque. Now for videos, yes, as I, as I said, you want to turn off auto playing. And the way to do this is you can use JavaScript to detect whether or not Prefers Reduce Motion is on. And you can do that with the window.matchmedia API. So if you call the window.matchmedia API with a media feature, uh, and this needs to be a full media feature. So uh, as you can see, it also includes the brackets inside the quotes. Uh, this is something I do wrong quite often because there's already parentheses there, uh, but they need to be inside the quote as well. Um, then you get back an object, and one of the values on that is matches. Uh, and that will, that's a Boolean that will tell you whether or not this particular uh, media query matches. So what you can see, what I did here is I tested for no preference and I assigned that to uh, a constant called autoplay video because then now I can use that for when I can play autoplaying video because the default of course is that you don't autoplay. Now, for the next couple of media queries, uh, they have either no support or they work in only a few browsers or support is only implemented for a part of the media query. So like in general, here be dragons. First up is Prefers Reduced Transparency. With Prefers Reduced Transparency, uh, users can indicate they want to see text on a solid background. The way this, uh, the, they want this usually due to visual impairments, which can make it very hard to read text on patterned backgrounds or noisy backgrounds, but it can also help people with dyslexia or concentration problems, simply because there's less going on around the text that they're trying to read. Unfortunately, there is no browser support yet at all. Uh, like reduced motion, there's two options. And once support lands, consider again to make the reduce case the default and only add your transparencies and backgrounds when the no preference media query matches. Almost as unsupported is prefers contrast. So prefers contrast indicates whether your user wants to show your site with less or more contrast. So more contrast makes intuitive sense, like visual impairments can make it difficult to pick up subtle differences in color. So people that have that will prefer a higher contrast. It, it, like, it literally makes things easier to read for them. But like, who wants less contrast? Who looks at something and says, you know, this would be better if it was more difficult to read? Not many people. However, uh, people with light sensitivity issues might prefer a screen with less harsh contrasts, like full black or full white can be very taxing on, on some people. So they will want to use less contrast. Now, between these two, note that wanting less transparency is not the same as wanting more contrast. Uh, there are different media queries that solve different issues. I just said almost as unsupported because there's actually one and a half browser that already supports first contrast. Uh, Current Safari technology preview supports prefers contrast with the more value, though not with any of the other values. And that activates when a user turns on the increased contrast accessibility option in Mac OS. If you have a Mac, this is a very nice option to turn on just to see what happens because it gives a really good idea of the things you want to change when prefers contrast more matches. Uh, as you can see from this screenshot, uh, they don't just make all the backgrounds white and all the text black. What they do instead is they switch out a lot of the shading that they use for areas for things like borders. And they dial down the box shadows. So 
what this essentially does is it makes all the delineations delineations much easier to see like all the areas are much clearer uh, and that's something you will want to do as well when you implement the uh, preverse contrast more value the other browser that uh, has support for all of the values is chromium 96 uh, which is the current beta version of chromium although I am not aware of any operating system that can trigger, for example, perverse contrast less. Uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, it's just on Mac where that increased contrast option is available. Uh, so support is there, but if your users can't turn it on, is support really there? I'm not sure. Now, if you've been paying attention to the screen, you'll notice that I've skipped over one, and that's perverse contrast custom what does that mean um, you don't want more contrast you don't want less contrast you want a custom contrast it it doesn't make sense so this used to be called perverse contrast forced and it would match when forced colors which i'll talk about in like a few minutes was active now perverse contrast forced got removed, uh, which was an excellent idea because it, it was super confusing uh, because prefers contrast starts with prefers. So uh, this means that it's something you have to change. Like the user is asking you, please give me more contrast. Whereas forced colors will have already gone through your entire site and messed everything up uh, in order to make everything properly readable. Uh, so there was there was a mismatch there, uh, and they solved that by removing the prefers contrast forced value, except they now brought it back for prefers contrast custom. So prefers contrast custom will match when forced colors is active, but when forced colors is active, all your colors will have already been overwritten to whatever your user has chosen. So the user has already set text color, the user has already set a background color to their preferred contrast. Uh, so what gives? Why does this exist? Well, it exists because the specification wants at media prefers contrast without a value to match when forced colors is on. And the goal for this is to provide a hook for multiple different situations where a user would want what they call reduced visual complexity. Um, the idea is that by giving one hook for this, people can reduce visual complexity for all situations, like more contrast, less contrast, or forced colors. All of these benefit from less visual complexity. When I say less visual complexity, I mean things like shading, box shadows, text shadows, things that add like a sort of noise to the concept of text and background, right? I think this is a very misguided idea, uh, but then I, I, I am not a spec writer. Um, but what I do see is that adoption of user preference media queries already is super low. So the last thing you want to do is add something like this, where I need to spend four minutes explaining to you why this exists and what it does and how it really has nothing to do with either contrast or, or forced colors. Uh, so I don't think it add much, adds much, and I don't think it will be used much either, but you know, we'll see. Uh, leave your thoughts in the comments below. <laughs> um, so on to something that does work, uh, inverted colors. So inverted colors is an option that is only supported on macOS. And you'll notice it doesn't start with prefers. Uh, that's because the operating system, uh, and Mac OS and the browser Safari have already inverted all the colors for you. So at this point, you might think that you need to use this media query to double invert images and videos like we did for cheap dark mode. But Safari is, is pretty clever and already does that for you. You can, however, use this media query to you shift your color, your site back to the original colors to make sure that your brand colors are, are still followed. Uh, 
in general, I think the preferred color scheme and dark mode in macOS are like more or less the successors to this media query. Um, like this media query has been in Mac OS and this setting has been in Mac OS for quite a while, uh, like before they had a proper dark mode. Um, and I think right, right now it's just sort of a, a leftover. So in terms of values, it's either none or it's inverted. Now on the Windows side, we have forced colors, as I as I mentioned earlier, uh, and forced colors is uh, a feature that maps to the Windows high contrast mode. And Windows high contrast mode lets users specify and overwrite all their colors on their entire operating system. Usually, this is to create like high contrast black on white or high contrast white on black color schemes. But you can create your own theme, so it can also be used for sepia or or even wilder color schemes, or you know whatever works well for that particular user. So, high contrast mode is a bit of a misnomer, and that's also why it's called forced colors in uh, in CSS. Notice that this media query also doesn't begin with prefers, because your browser has listened to the operating system and has already overwritten all the colors on your site so that everything is uniform with everything in the rest of the operating system. So the active keyword will tell you if it's active or not. Uh, in addition, if one of the th themes has a black background, then preferred color scheme dark will also match. So browsers look at the background color that a theme has set to determine whether or not it's a light theme or a dark theme. Now, because all the colors have already been overwritten by the browser, there's not really much for you to do with this media query, except make sure that things like, for example, SVG icons are still visible and where you use backgrounds to provide uh, differences between areas, you need to update that and use borders because all the backgrounds will have been reverted to the same color uh, which is canvas on the slide here. So any differenti differentiation you made with the background is now gone and you'll need to add like a border or outline depending on what works for your design to make sure that that delineation is still there provided that's it, that it's important for your site. Um, now, because you don't know the colors that a user has used, you can't just guess and add, you know, black or white or whatever. So instead, you can use the CSS color names. Now, there used to be CSS color names in CSS2 in, uh, that was two decades ago. Uh, but it turns out that if you add all the possible colors of your operating system into CSS and give that to web developers, uh, which is what CSS2 did, then they can use that to exactly copy the UI of whatever operating system is visible. Uh, and you can very easily use that for, uh, for nefarious purposes. So they removed almost all of them. Uh, and in CSS4, they reintroduced this much smaller list uh, that works really well with force colors because it's text background colors uh, text and background for buttons, link colors, disable text, uh, and highlight highlighting. So it, it, it's a much smaller set. Um, and again, like all of this will have already been changed for you. So links will already have link text, buttons will already have button text, etc. Now, when you search online, uh, you'll find the advice that for SVG icons, uh, you can just use current color and then it will follow along with the colors that their parent element uses. So if you have an SVG in a button, it will get the button text color. If you have an SVG in a link, it will get the link text color. And that used to work and that will work again. But right now it's broken in all Chromium browsers. Uh, and that's because a uh, specification change was made that didn't take this into account where current color was resolved at the wrong time, essentially. Uh, 
a fix is already on the way, so that will be in browser soon. But for now, that's something you need to, to look out for. Now, if all your colors are changed, what happens when the colors you chose are actually important? For example, when you're showing color swatches for a product in a web shop, um, you can opt out of force colors with a little bit of CSS called force colors are just none. But do make sure to use that just for the elements where your chosen colors are important uh, and definitely not for entire pages or sections on a page. For these three, forced colors, prefers contrast and inverted colors, it's very important to realize that they don't serve the same purpose. Surface level, they, you know, it seems like they use or they, they do more or less similar things, but force colors overrides all your styling to something that your user wants it. Obviously, uh, often with significantly increased contrast, with prefers contrast, the user still wants more or, or less contrast, but it's up to you to make that happen. And a corollary to that is that the user would still like to see your design. Like they want your design choices. They just want more contrast or less contrast within your design choices. And then lastly, inverted colors has, doesn't have an explicit goal. Uh, it's mostly used to make screens less bright for people uh, before there was a proper dark mode in most operating systems. So onto the environment. Uh, we will be getting at some point, hopefully maybe, access to uh, environment media queries, for example, light level. So the light level media query will let us respond to how much light is around a device. Uh, you might have noticed that if you use a Mac, if you put your hands like in the wrong place, uh, your screen suddenly starts to dim. Uh, that's because there's a light sensor there and uh, Mac will adapt the screen brightness to what it thinks is the uh, brightness in the environment. Um, the idea is that the operating system will tell this value to the browsers and it will do that in, in three uh different values dim normal or washed so dim is for a uh, dark environment normal is for whatever they consider average and then washed is for bright environments now what you want to do here is not very sure because operating systems as i mentioned already use those light sensors to dim or brighten the screen when they feel that it's needed so on your site, you don't need to like darken or lighten your site yourself. The operating system already takes care of that. What you could do is, uh, you know, decrease the blues, the blue colors when it's dark or increase the text contrast when it's very bright. So that text still remains readable on the screen. That's for example, reflecting a lot of sunlight. So rather than just you know, making things brighter and making things darker, think of trying to increase or decrease the contrast along with what the operating system is already doing. Now for the network, we have prefers reduced data. Not everyone is lucky enough to have fast or reliable internet or you know, be able to watch a live stream over Zoom with a bunch of people and even if you have fast internet, you might not have reliable internet or unlimited data plans. So you might have a data cap. Browsers can send these saved data on header and web servers can then choose to send smaller images and videos uh, and disable any form of preloading, server push or polling. Now doing this on a server is often hard to do. Because you as a developer, as a web developer, very frequently lack access to the server configuration uh, or the configuration requirements are just like way too complex. And that's unfortunate because it can have an, a big impact on who gets to see and use your website. So coming up is the prefers reduced data media query. Uh, it's not available in browsers yet, but you can emulate it in Chrome, uh, 
uh, after setting the right flags and you can emulate it out of the box in polypane. So with the perverse reduced data media query, you can do less than with the save data header. The save data header would basically let you send an entirely different website from the server, uh, but perverse reduced data is much easier to use because you can use it right on your site in CSS and make the changes like where you're sending the data. For example, you can prevent downloading fonts and background images. You can download smaller images. You can prevent auto playing and preloading uh, videos uh, using, again, the Match Media API in JavaScript. And uh, while I won't go into all of the things you can do right now, uh, I did write a very long blog post about that, which you can find on the URL, URL on screen now. Um, bit.ly slash prefers dash produced dash data. Uh, and uh, someone asks at which page size would you use the prefers reduced data query? Um, so I, it's like it's not really related to, to page size in as much as the stuff you have on a page. So it's all about making choices. Like when someone has prefers reduced data on, they essentially indicate I want your content. I just don't want like everything around it. So you could make a choice, for example, that you can send your data. You just don't send your fancy font along as well. So you know that shapes of like a few hundred megabytes. Uh, or instead of having the very nice large header image that's two megabytes or, or three megabytes, uh, you just don't load that or you load a solid background color or you load uh, like a fancy blurry version of that, which is just a few kilobytes. You know, it's, it's about making, making those choices and it, it's not like there's an upper limit and, and you need to cap it there uh, because it, again, it's about the content. And if you have a lot of content on a page, then that in itself can already be big, but that's valuable to your user. So it's, it's those choices. Now, even though prefers reduced data is not available yet, you can already detect the safe data header in JavaScript with the navigator.connection API. Uh, that's available in Chrome and available behind a flag in Firefox. And you can use that as well to prevent things like preloading or uh, if you want to get extra fancy, you know, set a class on the HTML that uh, people don't want to save data. So save data by default, add a class uh, when they're okay with downloading the extra fonts, auto playing video, uh, downloading all the background images, etc. And this API will also tell you if someone is on a slow connection with uh, the effective type value. Uh, and this, this can be things like slow 2G, 2G, 3G, and 4G uh, as text values. Um, and the nice thing is that this doesn't just check the type of connection, uh, but also the connection speeds and how long it took to connect to the server to give you an approximation, uh, like the effective speed. Because of course you can be on Wi-Fi, but the Wi-Fi can be crappy, uh, and you can be on 4G, but it can be super fast. Um, it's worth noting that the uh, Chrome team is working on updating this API uh, because as it turns out, having the list go from 2, 2G to 4G isn't really future proof. Uh, so that needs to be revised. Uh, you can combine these with the test for prefers reduced data using the Match Media API. Uh, and Combining those two, you can sort of catch everything. Now onto the device, because people still use devices and devices are still important. Um, and the nice thing is that we're getting more information about the device and its capabilities in the browser. So two of these are screen insets and interaction media queries. Every phone nowadays has a notch, every laptop in the next four or five years, we'll probably also have a notch. Um, 
And with the advent of notched phones, Apple introduced a new viewport property called Viewport Fit Cover. And without it, your site is shown with these ugly bands on the left and the right with on your phone in, in landscape mode. And that exists to prevent your site from being covered up by the notch. Now, when you turn viewport fit cover on in your viewport media uh, meta tag, your site goes from edge to edge, but the notch now sits over your site content. So since you don't know how large the notch is and on which side it is, because you can hold your, your phone both with the notch on the left and the notch on the right, uh, Apple came up with a solution. Uh, and that solution is CSS environment variables. So you can use this, these in your CSS to make sure that your content isn't obscured by a notch or, or really any other overlaid UI. Uh, and you can use them in similar ways to CSS variables. So you have uh, an env CSS function that takes a value. Uh, those values are predetermined. And you can also provide a fallback value. Uh, for when that value is like the uh, safe inset is not defined. Uh, Android phones, of course, also got notches after the iPhone got a notch. So this feature is also available in Chrome for Android. Um, it's worth noting that these environment variables don't provide extra padding. So if you just use these values, your content will be flush against the edges, which might not look super nice. So you'll probably want to combine them with a calc function to have, to have some default padding. Now, lastly, I want to point out the interaction media queries. So these are actually supported across the board in all evergreen browsers. And we have many different input devices nowadays compared to when the web got started. Like mouses still exist, but we now also have touch we have styluses, we have external controllers like a Wii controller. And we even have things like hand detection with a Kinect or AR glasses. Now, things that are easy to do with a mouse can be harder with these other devices. Hovering might not be available uh, and precise clicking something might also be like essentially impossible. So with these media queries, we can adapt to these input devices in, in clever ways. And this is how I would do it. Uh, you can consider touch devices as the most minimal thing you need to support because it doesn't have hover and your input device is your thumb. So that makes it really hard to point precisely at a small target. So you have hover none and pointer is coarse. From there, uh, you can have devices with a stylus. They add precision, but no hover. You can add Wii controllers. They add hover no precision. And lastly, a mouse or a touchpad has both hover as well as precise clicking. So these media queries only check the primary input device, but a user might use multiple input devices on a single computer. So you need to make sure that your UI works with all of them regardless of what the primary input device is. And you can check for all input devices with any dash hover and any dash pointer. So that's the roundup of all the new and upcoming ways we can respond to user preferences, their network environments and device capabilities. Uh, with these, you can optimize and personalize the experience that they have with your website by responding to their preference. Uh, and in this way, you can create truly responsive websites. Here's my plug. Uh, throughout this presentation, I use Polypane, uh, which is a browser for developers that I make please check it out at polypain.com. You can start a free trial and play around with all these media queries in, uh, in a very easy way. So I'm Kilian Velkov, and you can find me at these places.